Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Emmanuel Church. It is so good to have you with us this evening. Um, some of you I know, some of you I don't know. I'm the pastor here, one of the pastors at Emmanuel Church. And um, if you are visiting us, it's especially good to have you. I hope that you uh, enjoy your time with us. Uh, we're, of course, here uh, because we have a very special guest with us. So it is a great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome this evening uh, Pastor Sam Albury with us. Uh, Sam is a, uh, an author, an apologist, uh, a pastor from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, which will become very obvious when you hear his accent. And um, we, uh, we are going to be hearing tonight on, um, on understanding the cultural landscape in our world today. And um, as, uh, as I'm sure you have realized, and probably why you're here, that is a hugely important topic for all of us. So uh, welcome. It's great to have you along. And welcome to those who are watching on our live stream as well. Just to say, we are going to have a time at the end for questions and hopefully answers. Um, and uh, the questions will need to be sent to the, uh, the phone number up there, WhatsApp or SMS to that number. So if you have a question, um, you're welcome to pull out your phone. No one's going to look at you funny. They might, but just tell them you're sending a, a, qu a question for later. Um, you're most welcome to do that. And then we will seek to, uh, well, Sam will seek to answer those questions at the end of the evening. Um, so please make use of that as well. Sam, I wonder if I could invite you up with, uh, without any further ado and... Um, and maybe just ask a couple of questions to get to know you. Um, it is so good to welcome you to Emmanuel Church. You're Thank also you. from an Emmanuel Church. Yeah, we spell ours with an I. Yeah, what is the correct spelling? Well, in my Bible, it's, it has an I when it says Emmanuel in, right. in Isaiah. I'm just saying. Suitably rebuked. Um, <laughs> so this is your first time in South Africa? It is. Um, what are your first impressions? Uh, I'm very much enjoying it. It's... I, the, the church I was previously at, I'm from England, by the way, I live in America, I am from England. My previous church in England had a sizable South African contingent. So I feel as though South Africa has already come to me in the past and now I get to come to it. But uh, it means it's not too much of a shock to the system. Um, we, we quickly learned as a church that any time we had a, a church bry, the South Africans run it. We just give it to them. <laughs> Um, the only problem with that is if anyone wants anything that has ever grown out of the ground to eat, they have to bring it themselves. Um, Sorry, just, just what are the things growing out the ground that you would eat? Was, <laughs> well, I gather the South, like chicken. the South African for salad is, is chicken, yes. So, uh, but no, I've, I've had, a, I've had a, a great time being here. It's been lovely to be here. Great. People are very friendly. So you're an Englishman um, working as a pastor in Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like a, a long way from England. How did you end up there? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the short version is I um, had sensed God was nudging me to, to move towards the States. And I'd always thought if I move anywhere, I want to base that move around a church. That church will be my, my community. And I had become friends with a pastor in Nashville who had planted this church. He invited me to come and preach there one, one time a few years ago. And... I can't really describe it in any other terms than the first time I, I encountered this church, I had a crush on it. Um, and they weren't appalled by me as a human being either, thankfully. And so the ministry I had been working for kind of folded up and the church said, why don't you come and join our, our pastoral team? So I'm very thankful to be there. If you're wow. ever in Nashville, come and say hi. Right, so any aspiring musicians, I guess, would find themselves yeah, in Nashville? Yeah, everyone in Nashville is an aspiring musician. Every waiter, every person in a coffee shop who's serving you coffee is, I'm only doing this until I get the music thing together. Yeah. Um, I haven't met anyone who's playing stadiums who's saying, I'm only doing this until I get the waiting thing like Make a good cup of coffee. Place. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, um, you've kind of ministered in both worlds, the UK, the States. What's the same and what's different, culturally speaking? I suppose it's a big question. But if you had to sort of pick some of the things that you've noticed or that have struck you. Um, yeah, it, it is. And obviously, America's a big place anyway, and Nashville is one part of it. Um, so Nashville is in the south, so the south is, is a bit different even within, within America. Um, it's, it's very positive and uncynical. We, we, we Brits are very cynical. Hmm. Americans tend to be more upbeat and positive. Um, the south is very, is very hospitable. Um, which again is, is <laughs> different. I come from the south of England where we just don't talk to each other at all, if we even, even if we're related. Um, 
So that, that has been different. Uh, what is the same is, is the human heart and its, its need for Jesus. Um, and so that, that is always, wherever we go in the world, however different things may be culturally, we know ultimately people's greatest need is, is the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Now, Sam, you've written many books and, and articles over the years. Uh, three that I just wanted to highlight. There is a book table, if you hadn't noticed, in the foyer. Uh, CBD have books at excellent prices. Um, I think you were saying the other day you're not sure how they're going to stay in business at those prices. So make sure you go and have a look. But um, why does God care who I sleep with? I think the title says it all. Um, what God has to say about our bodies... Also a critically important question. And then um, a short but punchy book, Is God Anti-Gay? Now those three books, as you will sense, are all around issues of identity and sexuality. And you've, so you've written a lot on these sorts of topics. Um, how did you end up identifying those as, as issues that you wanted to write on? Yeah, there, there are two reasons. One is that and obviously it's such a, a kind of culturally pressing area of, of issues to think through. Um, there's been a lot of change in culture over the last 10, 15 years. And so part of it is me trying to sort of get my head around that and sort of process things in the light of what the Bible says. Um, as, as a pastor too, I'm, I'm just aware that so many of these issues were becoming present in the church in different ways, confusion over the body, over identity, over sexuality. And it's been part of my own journey too. When I came to faith, I, I was a teenager who had just begun to realize he was attracted to guys and not to girls. So one of the first things I really had to sort of think through as a new disciple of Jesus was, what do I, how does my faith fit in with those sexual feelings? What does, what does being a follower of Jesus look like and all of that? So these things are pretty close to home for me, as they are for, I'm sure, many of us in different ways here as well. Well, we really look forward to hearing what you have to say on understanding our culture. Can I pray for you? Please Let's do. ask the Lord to be with us as we uh, meet together. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the privilege of being able to sit and listen and think about these important questions and topics. Lord, we ask that as Sam speaks, that you would speak, that we would have a real sense of what you are saying to us tonight, that you would use uh, the next few minutes as we think about this important topic to help orientate us in this world, uh, to be better followers of Jesus. Uh, to better understand where we find ourselves, uh, perhaps to more effectively make an impact in the world around us. So, Lord, we commit this evening to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you for, for coming along tonight. I hope it will be of, of help and of interest. Um, I can't remember the exact wording of the title, but we're thinking about the sort of cultural changes that have happened, how we've got to where we are. And I want to think about this in, in two sort of parts. How we, how we best understand our neighbor, um, if our neighbor is not a Christian, and the sort of cultural things that have, sh have helped shape our neighbor. And then in the light of that, secondly, how we might begin to engage in some of the cultural conversations happening all around us when it comes to some of these particular topics. And I want to frame our discussion with some... Uh, observations from Mark chapter 6. If you have a, a Bible to hand or on a device, you, can, uh, you have permission to stare at a screen for a moment uh, to look up Mark chapter 6. Um, I was just reading through Mark a while back and minding my own business, and this verse really struck me, and it's been helping me as I've been thinking through some of these things. So Mark chapter 6, and I'll read from verse 30. Uh, and in the context, Jesus has just sent the apostles out to do a sort of mission, and they're now coming back and reporting in. And in Mark chapter 60, verse 30, we read, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. So they have been there busy serving, ministering, and Jesus says, let's just, let's just us, you and, you and me, let's just go somewhere quiet and rest. And I, I love that Jesus is like that. <laughs> uh, he cares about that. He cares about time with us where we can rest with him. Um, and I'm, I'm very convicted that often I think about rest not necessarily as being rest with Jesus, 
Uh, sometimes I'm thinking it's a rest just from everything. But actually with Jesus is the, is the very best kind of rest we can have. Uh, we're told for many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Many of us will know what that can feel like if we have day jobs that involve lots of people, lots of demands, lots of complicated things to sort of sort out for folks. And we know what it's like when we don't even have time to grab lunch in the middle of the day and we're emotionally depleted. Uh, even if we're the most extroverted person on the planet, we have a limit. And we're peopled out, we're hungry, we're tired, uh, we know that feeling. So, verse 32, they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Excellent. Just what the, the doctor ordered. Except, verse 33, now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So just imagine, I don't know if any of you, I'm sure some of you are school teachers, uh, just imagine that however much you feel that is a, a calling and a vocation and a privilege, there comes a limit where you, you, know, you need to get away from the, the lovely pupils and the holidays are coming, you're counting down the weeks, three weeks to go, two weeks to go, one week to go, three days to go, and then finally the holidays come and you get in your car and you drive off into the sunset to wherever it is you're going and you finally get there, you step off the, the plane or the boat or the car or whatever it is and you're there on holiday and your class is there. <laughs> because somehow they heard you were going there for your holiday and thought, let's go there too, that would be really fun. And this is a bit like what it must have been for Jesus and his disciples. They finally get away and they realize everyone has, has just got there first. And I know how I would feel in that situation. And so here's the thing that really struck me. It's verse 34. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, if that was me, it would have read, he went ashore and saw a great crowd and he unloaded on them. I would have been irritated. I would have scolded them. But when Jesus sees this very crowd that he's been trying to get everyone away from and get a break from, he has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The reason this crowd, in one sense, was so exhausting to Jesus is because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, sheep are not just meant to be sort of fluffy, cute, impish creatures. In, in, sheep, in reality, are ridiculous creatures. Um, they are helpless. They have virtually no defenses. Um, and they are clueless. Profoundly so. Uh, they, they do need just constant supervision not to utterly destroy themselves. That's just what they do. And of all the animals the Bible could compare us to, the one it compares us to the most is sheep. Uh, we are like sheep without a shepherd by nature. And yet as Jesus sees the lostness of this crowd, he has compassion. He's not frustrated with them for being lost, but he has compassion on them. And it struck me that is a good note for us. As we see so many aspects of our culture moving in a direction that seems to be further away from kind of Christian values, Christian moorings, Christian sanity, we might think. It's easy for us to respond to cultural shifts with, with anger and frustration and how dare they. Particularly when culture feels like it's, it's turning on us in certain areas. And again, we can, we can get kind of prickly and defensive and, and shouty back at them. Whereas it strikes me as, as something we need to learn from. If the one who actually had the right to be angry at them is compassionate, then how much more should we be so? So as we see whatever it is we're seeing in culture around us, why don't you join me in praying that we would have the eyes of Jesus for the people that we see, that we too would feel a sense of, of compassion uh, the next thing that struck me was, was what happens next. We know that Jesus is about to feed them because in my Bible it, it has that as the heading. Jesus feeds the 5,000, so we know that's about to happen. But the very first thing Jesus does, the very most immediate expression of his compassion 
is at the end of verse 34 where it says, and he began to teach them many things. The most compassionate thing Jesus could do is to teach people about himself. And I'm struck by the word many. Jesus began to teach them many things. There's not just sort of one thing people need to learn about Jesus. There's so many things to be learned about Jesus. And again, as we, God willing, feel a sense of compassion for the, for the world around us in, in its lostness, actually the, the best way we can serve people around us is by trying to introduce them to the truth of Jesus, the multifaceted truth of Jesus. Try and introduce them to some of the many things that there are to learn from and about Jesus. And this is great for us as well because we are still learning those many things ourselves. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> There's always more to learn about Jesus. Um, I was given the chance in, in a little bit of free time I had during this trip to go and visit Cape Point. Um, and, you know, it's, it's extraordinary scenery. Um, as the road sort of winds its way around the hills and the mountains, every time we kind of crested a hill or went round a bend, I just found myself going, oh, wow, oh, wow, and oh, wow. And it, it's, it's stunning. And discipleship is a bit like that. Uh, the more we go on with Jesus, the, the, there's always more to be wowed at with Jesus. There's always more of those many things to learn. It's one of the things I love about being a Christian. Uh, you don't have that feeling you have when you are coming to the end of the, the final series of a really great TV show or you're coming to the end of a, a really great book and you're already starting to feel sad about coming to the end of it. With Jesus, that never happens. There's always more to learn. However much Jesus wows us, we get to think, and there's going to be even more of, of those many things that Jesus has for us to learn. So as we think about some of these cultural shifts and try and sort of get a, a read on them, let's, let's do that with this framing our discussion, that the compassionate Jesus wants people to learn about him. And that should be our burden too. So with that said, we, we will not effectively share Jesus with our neighbours if we don't actually understand our neighbours. Which is why I want us to think about how we understand what culture's gone through and how people have got to where they are. Uh, one of the, the things that brought this home for me um, a couple of years ago now was um, I was working for a Christian ministry and they asked me to, to do a, an online kind of webinar -y type thing. And the title they gave me was How Can I Know my gender. We were doing a series of presentations under the heading of trending questions. We were trying to pick questions that people were wrestling with in our culture and then trying to see if we had a unique Christian perspective to bring to that kind of question and conversation. And so they thought, well, okay, here's a question people are wrestling with. How can I know my gender? Let's have a, let's have a session on that and show people what unique resources the Christian faith gives us to understand and answer that question. So we started advertising this event. I started preparing what I was going to say for it. And that the ministry immediately started getting some angry emails from different parts of the Christian world uh, to the effect of people saying, listen, why are you entertaining such a stupid question? I've lost all respect for you. You guys have completely sold out. I can't believe you're asking such a ridiculous question. It's so, it's so stupid. And it made me realize, okay, now we have two aims for this session. It's not merely trying to bring a Christian you know, perspective to bear for secular people who are thinking this through, but I also realize it's an opportunity to help Christians think about why it is their non-Christian friends are asking this question. Because if we think someone is asking a ridiculous question, we're unlikely to have a response to that question that is going to help that person come to Jesus. Uh, maybe it's just me, but I've, I've still not met someone who has been ridiculed into the kingdom. And if we think what our neighbor is, is the burning question our neighbor has, if we think it's stupid, <laughs> then I, I want to suggest we're, 
we're not going to be good at actually loving our neighbor and, and bringing Christ to our neighbor. We need to understand our neighbor. We need to know, well, why is, why is that question weighing so heavily on their heart and on their mind? What, what's gone on behind the scenes to sort of make that a real pressing issue? So as we think about the changes that have happened when it comes to our, our thinking about gender, our thinking about sexuality, here are four things that I have seen change that help me account for why we've got to where we are. I'm sure there are other ways of analyzing culture, other factors to consider, but these are the ones that sort of help me at least begin to get my head around what's happened and how we got to where we are. So four significant cultural changes. The first is that our moral intuitions have changed. So two very quick data points. I was at university in the mid-1990s, and in the mid-1990s, the mainstream kind of view on marriage amongst people who weren't Christians is that marriage is between a man and a woman. That was just the, the sort of assumed thing. There were some voices calling for same-sex marriage to be recognized, but those were very much minority voices even in the secular world. The mainstream opinion, even among secular people, was marriage is a man and a woman. Now, fast forward 25, 30 years, and if you go onto a secular university campus today, it is very obvious that people think, well, no, of course, marriage is between any combination of, of people irrespective of their sex. That has changed dramatically, and the reason for that is because our moral intuitions have changed. Um, there's a, a writer called Jonathan Haidt, who is a, he's a sociologist who teaches at, at New York University. He's, he's not a, a Christian, he's an atheist, kind of culturally Jewish thinker. But he wrote an extraordinary book a few years ago called The Righteous Mind, where he shows that actually we respond to ethical issues intuitively more than we do kind of intellectually. In other words, when some moral situation presents itself or, or idea or concept presents itself, we have a kind of gut reaction. We have an intuition as to whether it seems right or not. We don't sort of have a, a completely thought through ethical grid. We just think, actually, it, that intuitively feels right. That tends to be how we do our, our kind of moral concluding on things, if that makes sense. And part of Haidt's thesis is the moral taste buds <laughs> that drive those intuitions have changed in the last 20 years. And so today, the, the moral intuitions tend to be things like this. Is it, is it harming anyone else? And if it isn't, then it's very hard for me to say I think it's wrong. Um, is it something that feels like it's it's freeing for someone, or is it something that feels like it's restrictive and oppressive for someone? Again, we have a kind of a gut instinct about something. Um, is it, does it seem fair, or does it seem discriminating? Uh, those tend to be the main ways in which people today have a moral intuition about any given moral subject. And when you apply those intuitions to gay marriage, it's, it then becomes obvious why people now think gay marriage is, is intuitively acceptable. Because how does it harm anyone else if, you know, if the, the, the lovely gay couple down the road from you get married? Is that, is that harming you? Answer no. So how could you, be a, a, you, know, how could you object to it? Um, or how can you deny their right to love and to express their love as they choose to, how can you say that it's fair if, if they can't marry but, but other couples can? Thought through in that way, it's, it's understandable why it's intuitive to so many people today that, that gay marriage is, is to be supported. Our moral intuitions have changed. And we need to know that because if we don't understand the intuitions that are shaping people's thinking on this, we're going to find it very hard to actually engage in conversation. Um, back in England, there's a, there's a BBC uh, TV show which kind of looks at different ethical issues and it tends to have people from different sides of, of these kinds of conversations and they each kind of give their pitch to why they think this particular thing 
And the audience weighs in with their own questions and, and ultimately sort of gives their own verdict. And there was an episode, not just on whether gay marriage is right, but there was an episode on whether the church should accept gay marriage. And the two people speaking, one was a, was a sort of prominent gay rights activist and one was a conservative pastor, a clergyman. And the, the activist was saying, well, you know, God is love. And, and this is love, so if God is blessing this, why isn't the church blessing it? And you could feel the audience completely going with her in that way of thinking. I'm sure many of us are going with her in that way of thinking. Oh, yeah, that, that kind of sounds right. Meanwhile, the, the, the conservative clergyman stood up and, and said, yes, yes, but the, but the Bible says that marriage is between a man and a woman. And every time someone said anything, he responded with, yeah, but the, but the Bible says that that's not right. Now, I think he's correct. The Bible does say these things. Uh, the Bible does have clear lines and, and teaching on this that is very different to where culture's at. And I'm very aware that it's easy to sit at home on, on my couch and to sort of think, oh, you know, I should, oh, he should have said this and not said that. But the fact is he was appealing to something that meant nothing to his audience. He was appealing to the Bible because as Christians, that's our authority. That's, that's conclusive. But to someone who's not a believer, they, why would they care what the Bible says? And he was, he was, I don't think, sufficiently understanding their moral intuitions. So we want to understand those moral intuitions so that we can engage with them and even, even use some of those moral intuitions to argue for our own Christian convictions. Uh, secondly, our view of minority groups has changed, particularly minority groups when it comes to issues of, of sexuality and gender. We look back at past discrimination against gay people, against trans people, and we feel collectively as a culture a sense of regret about how people have been treated in the past. Um, I don't know if you remember that movie, The Imitation Game. It's a few years old now. But it was about Alan Turing, who was a, a very significant code breaker in the Second World War and really helped turn the tide for, for the, the Western Allies. And he was a, a, a gay man and was arrested, chemically castrated, awful things were done to him. And again, we look back and we think, how, how, how could we have done that? How could we have, have thought that way? And what it means is because of that regret, we now take voices from, from minority groups that had been treated badly and we give those voices privilege in our culture those voices now have greater moral authority. And so when it comes to a, a question like sexuality, if you are a black female lesbian, your voice counts more to many people today than if you are a, a white male heterosexual. Because the thinking is we, we've got to give more airtime, more weight to the voices that have historically not been heard, which means it's, it's not a level playing field. It's not meant to be for many people. Um, I was doing a, a talk once at a, an American university. It was a, a talk for the, the Christian group on campus at this particular university. And they'd asked me just to come in and do, they had a regular sort of teaching evening every Wednesday night. They'd have a speaker come and they'd, they'd look at some topic. And they'd asked me to do something on the gospel and sexuality. And I was happy to come in and do that. It wasn't meant to be for anyone else in particular. It was the Christians that asked me to come and to teach them. But word had got out that they were planning this meeting with this particular topic and with me as a speaker. And the word went out on campus that there needed to be a protest. And so there was. Uh, there's a dozen maybe students who were there um, to protest the event. And here's, here's the thing about protesters <laughs> on a university campus. Other than the speaker, they are the only ones who are there early. <laughs> so for about 20 minutes, it was just me and these, these protesters. So I introduced myself and, and started having a conversation with them. They were lovely. They shared their pizza with me. I said, listen, I'm, I'm the guy who's speaking at this event you, you're unhappy with. And I said, listen, if you're happy to, I'd love to hear what your, your particular concerns are. It may be some of them I can help you with. It may be some of them I can't, but let's at least find out. 
And so they went around and each shared what their concerns were. And one of the themes that kept coming up was, we think your, your presentation is going to be harmful. Harmful for, for minority voices. And I realized that it didn't matter whether I was going to be respectful or gracious in my presentation. In their eyes, merely the presence of an alternative viewpoint was deemed to be harmful. And so I didn't need to be out-argued or out-debated. I just needed to be shut down. Because their perception was my viewpoint, however expressed, was going to harm people from minority groups had already been through enough. And that is why we have such a, a culture of censorship in many of our university campuses. Um, third thing, our view of sex and marriage has changed. Uh, sex has been almost entirely uncoupled from the need to procreate. It's now primarily a, a matter of recreation. And for many people, shouldn't ever have to be anything more than that. And so we, we guard our sexual freedom very seriously. Uh, when there are conversations about things like abortion and uh, the status of, a, of an unborn baby and all of those things, and as the technology shows us you know, more and more about what a, an unborn child is experiencing and can feel and all of those things, all of that is irrelevant for, for many people to the topic of abortion because the real issue is the fundamental need for sexual freedom. And anything that, that seems to constrain or threaten that feeling is, is regarded as an existential threat. Because sexual expression is seen as one of the highest goods. And so whatever your reasoning is for, for kind of constraining that expression in any way is seen as a fundamental and existential threat. Um, our view of marriage has changed because in earlier generations, Marriage was a, a lifelong covenant that was ordered towards procreation, even if it didn't always result in it. And now our definition of marriage has changed. And I don't just mean that we now allow for same-sex marriages in, in so many places. I presume here in South Africa as well. Do you have legalized same-sex marriage? Um, that's not the big redefinition of marriage. The big redefinition of marriage happened sometime before that. And that was when marriage went from being a lifelong covenant to a flexible romantic contract. Once we made that switch, actually it was inevitable that one day you would have same-sex marriage. Marriage is now a flexible romantic contract. And what that means is it's primarily a way of celebrating our mutual romantic fulfillment. And for as long as we're both being romantically fulfilled, we, we stick at it. But if there's a moment when one or both of us doesn't feel that fulfillment, we have every right just to step away. And so the marriage is less, the, the wedding is less about witnessing covenants being made and more about celebrating the way we both make each other feel. And if, if that's what marriage is about, then it, it seems un, unfair that certain types of romantic relationship should be able to have their day in the sun and other, other kinds of romantic relationships shouldn't. Um, it's why, by the way, as an as a, as a cl ordained clergyman and, and someone who gets asked to do weddings from time to time to officiate, uh, it's why one of my conditions is, I, I love officiating at weddings, but one of my conditions is you will not write your own vows. If you want to write your own vows, you're welcome to, but I won't officiate. Because in my experience, any time a couple writes their own vows, the vows they write entirely miss the point of what the marriage ceremony is for. Uh, we, we know that you love each other. I mean, it's your wedding day. We don't need 17 verses of bad poetry to know that you guys are, are into each other. Actually, the, the, the point of the wedding ceremony is to hear the promises you are making to each other. That is what is significant, but our view of marriage has changed. And then finally, our anthropology has changed, by which I mean how we understand who we are has changed. Uh, the real you now, the real you today, is the you that you feel yourself to be deep down inside. And the message of every Disney movie in the past 15 years is whoever that you is, you've got to be true to yourself. 
That is the most important thing. No one else can tell you who you are. You have to figure that out for yourself. And when you do, you've got to stick with it. You've got to be true to that. And so that the, it's all to do with what I feel myself to be. Uh, my body is seen as, as sort of an accident anyway, an accident of, of evolution and chance. Uh, we, if we believe fundamentally in evolution as a worldview, then we already believe that anything physical can become anything else physical. And so if my self-identity is different to my physical appearance, that's fine. My physical appearance can catch up to it. And therefore our bodies are entirely incidental to our identity. Whereas in the Bible, our bodies are both a gift and a calling. And when Jesus talks about the human heart, he's not saying you've got to look deep inside your heart to find out who you are. Jesus is saying if you look deep inside your heart, you will see what the problem is. Because Jesus says it's from out of the heart that come evil thoughts and so many other things that the, the, the Bible calls a sin. So four things that have changed our, our moral intuitions are view of different minority groups, particularly those when it comes to sexuality and gender identity. Our view of marriage and sex has changed, and our view of anthropology has changed. And what all of that means is that whereas when I was at university and was a Christian, I was seen as old-fashioned and quaint, today more likely... A Bible-believing evangelical Christian on a university campus isn't going to be seen as old-fashioned and quaint, but dangerous. Increasingly, Christianity is seen as being dangerous. And these cultural shifts I've mentioned, um, depending on what age we are, some of us, maybe those of us who are over 30, we have migrated into this new cultural moment. It's not where we began our lives. And so we've seen the culture shift and change around us and we're trying to kind of get our heads around it as, as those who've, who've come into this cultural moment from the outside of it. But for those maybe under 30, particularly for those under 25, this cultural environment is all they've known. It, it, they're native to it. And so what some of us perceive as cultural shifts that have happened around us those of us who are younger are thinking, no, this is just normal. This is how we think. And many of those people are in our churches. <laughs> uh, because we are being more formed by our, our phones than we are by our communities, we will realize that there is now a, a, a cross-cultural dynamic happening even within our own families. And one of the results of that is that increasingly those from a, a younger generation are not convinced by what the Bible says because their intuitions are, are, are not the same as the intuitions that we've had. Um, so they're either not convinced by what the Bible says or they're biblically convinced but not emotionally convinced. By which I mean they'll say, yeah, I know the Bible says you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that, but it kind of stinks that it says that. And I want to suggest if you are biblically convinced but not emotionally convinced, you won't stay biblically convinced. And so many of our churches, we're, we're sitting on a, a kind of generational time bomb and it's why so many people hit the age of, of 15 and just and quit church. And it, it's happening certainly in the States at a historic level. And not just the, the weird churches or the bad churches, but our churches. Um, in the last 25 years in the United States, over 40 million people have stopped going to church. That's more people than started going to church in both Great Awakenings and all of Billy Graham's crusades put together. It's the biggest shift in American religious history is people leaving the church now. And a lot of it is because of these cultural changes. So I probably depressed you now. So in the light of that, let's just spend a, a few minutes thinking about, given those cultural changes, how we might respond, <laughs> how we might engage in some of these conversations. So let me offer six pieces of advice. Most of these have come from having conversations that have gone badly, and then afterwards I thought, okay, what, what should I have done? What will I do differently next time if I'm in another conversation like that? So 
These may sound like I know what I'm talking about. Mostly it's because I've, I've not known what I'm talking about and I'm learning along the way. So first thing, and these are in no particular order, the first thing is we, know, we need to be those who listen well. Uh, we need to be good listeners. Again, we're not going to reach our neighbour effectively for, for Christ if we don't understand our neighbour. And the best way to understand someone is to listen to them. So Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13 says, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. And as those of us who are Bible-believing Christians, we, we believe in the truth, we believe in proclamation. And one of the dangers of that is that we can be too quick to speak. We can be too kind of trigger-happy with getting, getting the message out. And the Bible is full of, of cautions uh, and advice for us to actually listen before we speak. Because the more we listen to someone, the more we will begin to understand them, the more actually we will have an opportunity to say words that are not just true, but wise and apt and fitting. Similarly, Proverbs 20 verse 5 says, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water means that what's really going on with someone is often not evident on the surface. And it takes time to find out what, what the real heart issues are. That the angle someone is seeming to come towards you from may be actually different to what is really happening underneath. And so again, we need to take time to see what is, what is actually animating this person? What is behind the concern or the question or the objection or the doubt or the skepticism, whatever it may be? And it may take a long time to actually begin to discover what that is. So we need to be those who listen well. Secondly, uh, here's a rule of thumb that, is, that has helped me in so many situations. Don't say to someone what you can't say to everyone. Again, with the moral intuitions being the way they are, people are very attuned to anything that feels like it's discriminatory, like you're treating one group differently from another. And so the best way to kind of avoid that impression is to make sure you don't say to one person what you wouldn't say to everybody else, so that no one is being treated differently. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. I was speaking once on, on this kind of topic in a, at a university. A, a, one of the students came up and she said to me, I'm, so I'm a lesbian, and I want to know what you think about that. And I was, I was very glad to meet her. I was glad she introduced herself. But I said to her, well, Jesus has some challenging things to say about sexuality to every single one of us. And she said, why, what does he say? And I said, well, he says every single one of us is, is kind of broken in this part of life. That we have desires that are disordered, that we've, we've got these different loves that we don't order in the right way and we, we've got love that we don't quite know what to do with or how to express in the right way. And we had a long conversation about that and, and at no point in that conversation did I mention her lesbianism. And here's why, because if, if I had answered her question by saying, well, the Bible says being a lesbian is a sin, what she would have heard was that she was being singled out, that she was being looked down on, that she was being treated differently, and that she was being condemned. And so what I wanted to try to do was to show her how the, the message of Jesus when it comes to sexuality, I wanted to show her how that message lands on all of us before she finds out how it lands on her. Um, another time I was doing a Q&A and the question came up, do gay people go to hell, yes or no? And I think anyone deserves more than a one-syllable answer. But the answer I gave wasn't technically an answer to that question, but it was an answer to the question that they should have been asking, because the answer I gave was, if there's no hope for our gay friends, there's no hope for any of us. Because we're all in the same boat. Jesus treats us all the same. We're in this thing together. Don't say to someone what you can't say to everyone. 
Um, I met a young guy once at one of these events who came up to me and he said, listen, I'm not a Christian, I'm gay. I've read your little book, Has God Anti-Gay, twice now. I'm going through Mark's Gospel with a Christian friend and I've started joining a, a Bible study group and I'm going to church. So I said, okay, you're doing more Christian things than most of my church members back home are doing. So I said, what is, what is so drawing you to look at Christianity? And he said, well, because when I started looking at the message of Jesus, I realized he treats me the same as everybody else. And I started replaying Mark's gospel through his eyes. And I thought, yeah, of course he does. Because when Jesus turns up at the beginning of Mark's gospel, he says to everyone that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. Jesus doesn't turn up in Mark's gospel and say, right, here I am, time has come, kingdom of God is at hand now. I need all of you who are heterosexual to come over here because I've got something I'm going to say to you guys and everyone else is going to come over here and I've got something slightly different to say to you. No, Jesus has the same message for all of us. We're all in the same boat. And I said to this guy, why, why does it mean so much to you that Jesus treats you the same as everybody else? And he said, because that the gay community he had been in, the whole basis of it was we're different to everybody else. We, have, we need special protection, special rules, special privileges. We need a parade for us, and so on. And he said, I suddenly realized how much I wanted to be treated the same as everybody else. And it struck me that even a secular culture that prides itself on equality doesn't come close to the equality we see in Jesus. So don't, treat, uh, don't say to someone what you can't say to everyone. Uh, next, answer narrative with narrative. <laughs> um, what has changed people's minds on so many of these issues, whether it's gender identity or definition of marriage or whatever it might be, is not that everyone has kind of read lots of big ethical textbooks and, and kind of, oh, I've done a deep dive into to how ethics works and I've, I've changed my mind in the light of that. No, we've changed our views because we've heard over and over again narratives. We've heard narratives of someone discovering their true identity, of, of coming out and being public with that identity, of expressing it and living it out and flourishing because they did so. And you hear that story on repeat over and over again for 15 years, you change, your, you change your views. And so if we're wanting as Christians to commend a different viewpoint, one of the effective ways we can do that is by telling different stories and saying, actually, there are better stories in the church than there are in the world around us. Let's answer the, the stories of our, of our secular culture with the stories of God's people. Uh, let me just give you one, one quick example of this. There are two precious ladies at my, my church in Nashville who had been a lesbian couple for over 15 years. They had a, even had a daughter. And a few years ago, both of these ladies, one, then a few months later, the other came to, take, came to faith in Christ. They were living in a different part of the country at the time, but they, they knew they wanted to come back to church. They knew they had no idea how that was meant to work or what church they could come back to given the situation they had been in. But they had a family connection to my pastor in Nashville, and so they phoned him up and said, hey, we want to be Christians, we want to come to church, we know that your church is a church we would feel okay at and safe at, but how do we do this? What does it look like? How does this work? And my pastor and his wife said to them, well, come and live with us. And we'll, we'll just figure it out together. And my pastor had been in construction prior to being a pastor. And so he, that, you know, over the next few weeks, he just built out a whole bunch of rooms on his house. And then there was then space for everyone. So they moved in. And their, their first taste of discipleship was their, their family immediately getting bigger. As all of them, as a, as a bigger family, lived together and did life together. And they began their, their own journeys of discipleship, of following Jesus. I got to know them, and a few months after they had moved, I said to them, I was having lunch with the two ladies, and I said, listen, do you ever miss being a couple? You know, you were a couple for 15 years. And I was thinking in the back of my mind, in the eyes of the world, you've really downgraded. Because you've gone from being 
a couple to just friends. And they looked at me as if I was stupid, which, you know, fair enough. Uh, They looked at me and said, Sam, we're so much closer as sisters in Christ than we ever were as lovers. And I thought about that and I thought, well, of course, because God is love. God's way better at this than we are. When we walk in the ways of a God who is love, we're going to have a better experience of love than if we go against his ways. And I I want their stories like that to be heard. They've not found the teaching of Jesus to be oppressive and harmful and and dehumanizing. They're not leading some shriveled existence because now they're not romantically fulfilled. No, they have found walking with Jesus to be more life-giving than anything they ever had before. That obedience to Jesus for them has been liberating. Uh, Next, we need to show people the goodness of God. For some people today... All, all they know about Christianity, if they know anything at all, is random prohibitions. And sometimes, to be fair, that is, that is the only real noise we've made as Christians. Sometimes our, our witness has been, stop doing that, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. And we're not showing people the goodness of God. It just sounds like there are some arbitrary rules that have, have kind of landed from heaven and we we just all got to live by them whether you understand them or not and rebuttal is not persuasion telling someone they're wrong is not persuading what we need to be doing is is showing people what God is inviting us into God never says no to something without saying a much bigger yes to something else and so part of what we need to learn to do is to, is, to, is to try to explain to people what is the positive vision, say, of human sexuality that God is inviting us into and which therefore begins to account for the various prohibitions God has. So a good principle to, to, to kind of live by as you, as you look at the Bible yourself is to think any time there's a prohibition, any time there's a thou shalt not in the Bible, Ask yourself the question, what good thing is this prohibition protecting for me? How do I see the goodness of God in this prohibition? How is this prohibition actually good news? And we need to do that when it comes to sexuality. Uh, People are not going to care whether what we say is true if they don't believe it's good. So we need to learn how to articulate a a biblical vision for sexuality. There are different ways we can do that. I've tried to do that in a couple of my books. Uh, One of the ones I'm enjoying sort of thinking through at the moment is is how, you know, marriage is is, is meant to be a picture of Christ and the church. Uh, The opening words of the Bible are that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And one of the things we realize is that heaven and earth are meant to go together. And marriage is a picture of their eventual union. And all that makes life so difficult and so painful is because earth is so unheavenly. And we weren't designed for an unheavenly earth. It it strikes me as, as kind of telling that this is the only kind of world we have ever lived in, that we've ever known, that we've ever experienced. And yet all of us as a species together keep saying, oh, it's not supposed to be like this. From where did we get that idea? Because God has created us for a different kind of world. Jesus has us pray that his will would be done on earth as in heaven. The Bible ends with the, with the heavenly city coming down from heaven to earth as a bride adorned for a husband. And marriage between a man and a woman is a picture of the union of heaven and earth through Jesus. I think there's some traction there. Another friend of mine often uh, uses this, this way of speaking. When someone says, you know, why, why, do you, why do you believe in this sexual ethic and not what culture's saying? 
And my friend says something to the effect of, well, it depends what you think the story of the universe is. Do you want to be part of a story where you are the, the main player, where you are the, the, the big center of everything, and yes, you get to do everything you want sexually, but there's never going to be any meaning to the story. It's never going to go anywhere. It's never going to have any meaning. Or would you rather be part of a story where, yes, there are constraints on what you can do, but your life is going to have profound meaning and is definitely going to go somewhere. Now, he tells it much better than I just did, but there are ways we can try to show people actually we're going somewhere <laughs> when it comes to our understanding of sexuality. This is not just arbitrary rules. And then the final thing is we need to keep pointing people to Jesus. I mean, we need to do that anyway in any area of life as it happens, but particularly when it comes to this. Uh, when I teach on this to, to people who aren't Christians, I always teach the Christian sexual ethic from the Gospels, not because I don't believe in the, the full authority of the rest of the Bible. I do. I just want people to see Jesus says this stuff. I want them to know their issue is not with me, but it's with Jesus. I want people to realize that if they want me to change my mind on, on sexuality and on marriage, they first have to change my mind on Jesus. Because what I believe about these things flow from what I already believe about Jesus. I'm following him. And this is what he says. And so when someone says to me, as, as understandably people would, listen, you just can't believe that thing about marriage today. I'll say, yeah, I know that. I get that. But you may not realize you're actually telling me to stop being a Christian. Because I believe what I believe about marriage because I believe what I believe about Jesus. Are you, do you have the authority to tell me to stop following Jesus? And most of them at that point will go, okay, fair enough, we didn't know that was, that was what was going on. No, I'm not going to tell you to stop being a Christian. But every now and then someone will say, yes, if that's what you believe, you should stop being a Christian. To which I will simply say, well, okay, you just tell me what you've got going for you, that Jesus doesn't have going for him, such that I should believe what you say about this and not what he says. Okay, he died for me and rose again. That's where the bar is currently set. If you can improve on that, I am genuinely interested. But I want them to realize the issue is not bigoted Christians. Their issue is Jesus. They've got to reckon with him. Because the most loving and gracious, the one who described himself as gentle and lowly, he is the one who says these things about sex and marriage. And he is the one, actually, we want people to know. And so I say to people, listen, you've got to change my mind. You've got to prove to me Jesus isn't Lord if you want me to change my mind on marriage. And I say that because it's true. But I'm also saying that because I want them to scurry off and start looking at Jesus to see who he is. Because I'm fairly sure if I, if, if I can persuade someone to go away and come up with a reason why Jesus isn't Lord, I'm going to see them in church fairly soon. So let's point people to Jesus. Um, that is rushed, incomplete, um, and so on, but I'm going to quickly pray for us before we move into our time of Q&A. Father, please help us to be pointing to Jesus, not least by being like him. And again, we pray that as we see such a kind of, for so many of us, such a confusing cultural time, that we would have compassion on those who don't know the Good Shepherd, those who are are lost. And Father, help us to find ways to teach people about Jesus. As Jesus has taught us many things about himself, help us to be a conduit for other people to learn wonderful things about him too. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, thanks so much, Sam. We've got um, a few questions that have come in. I'm going to have to be selective. Just, just do the easy ones. How about that? Infolapsarianism. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I cannot spell that word. So here's a question. What kind of leaders does the church need to raise up for our modern culture? What's what kind of leaders does the church need to raise up for our modern culture our modern to culture? be effective, I guess? 
Yeah, I mean, this is going to sound so trite and so obvious, but really leaders who are faithful to the Bible. I mean, I know that's what we'd say of any age. It's, but because one of the things real faithfulness to the Bible leads us into is, is being people who are curious about culture, who are attentive, who do listen, who are, who are, who are trying to make every effort to get behind the ways people are thinking and to not just learn how to read the Bible, but how to read the world around us. And part of the challenge is thinking through, okay, what are some of the big dominant cultural themes and assumptions that are actually underneath the things that people are saying? And how can I bring the gospel of Jesus into conversation with those things? Um, I think actually what we need, whether it's Christian leaders or, or just Christians, is, is we just need to be good neighbors. Um, if we can be good neighbors who, who do care about people and who care about people precisely because we care about Jesus and he actually gives us a greater love for people than we would have had if we didn't know Jesus and we're seeking to be good neighbors, we're seeking to be faithful to Jesus. Actually, that, we need lots of that. Here's a broad question. Uh, some of these are quite broad, so you're going to have to just be selective in how you answer them. But in your experience doing ministry, what are some of the challenges young Christian people struggle with in our modern time? And what's your encouragement for them? Yeah, I think one of the challenges, and obviously big generalization, but um, what I've seen happening in so many churches is, again, where, where some of the younger people are at in their thinking is very different to where the people who are teaching them are at. And so sometimes it's very easy for the teaching to be just missing what are the real issues for some of the young people. And I've seen this in churches where, say, when it comes to some of these cultural issues, the, the, the people teaching the youth are teaching the youth what they had been taught when they were young. And it, kind of, well, it worked on me when I was 14, so I'm just going to do the same thing for these guys, not realizing that we're now in a different cultural situation. And I wouldn't expect to, to take, you know, all of my sermons from my ministry in England and then suddenly parachute into a place like Indonesia and just immediately preach those sermons. I'd want to think, now, hang on, I'm in a different cultural setting now. There are different values, different assumptions, and I need to think through how the unchanging message is best going to be explained in this setting. And we need to realize there is the same cross-cultural shift now with, within the younger generation. And so one of the challenges for, for younger people is they're not necessarily hearing the gospel in conversation with the ways they really think. And we, we need to do a better job of, under, again, understanding the cultural moment we're in and bringing the good news to bear on it. In what ways can the church community be more impactful to the world and the culture? Yeah, I love this question because the answer is, is, is so simple. We, let the church be church. And what we mean by that is not just that we turn up on a Sunday and do the things you do at church, but actually we embody as a church all that the New Testament calls us to embody. We're, we're meant to actually, somebody pointed out to me, churches are not meant to be new communities. They're meant to be a new kind of community. There's meant to be a kind of love embodied and expressed among us that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. You know, Jesus said, by this will all people know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. Not by how well put together you look, not by how amazing the worship band is or the teaching is, but by your love for one another. Uh, we live in, you know, all of these cultural shifts, one of the sort of net outcomes of these cultural shifts is there is a lot of anxiety, a lot of self-loathing, a lot of mental health struggles. And one of the ways we can actually be churches that make a real difference in our culture is by being places of genuine, tangible, non-ignorable love. Where people kind of feel like, I don't believe what these guys believe, but they feel like safe people. Because we're not all judgy and condemning. We're not cancelling each other every, every five minutes. We're actually believing a gospel which makes it safe for the worst things about us to be known by others. If we can lean into that, I think we will have traction with the world around us. People will then listen to what we're saying. When you speak about not leading with the Bible, because it's a different starting point, 
uh, different set of values that people are, are coming uh, to the question with. How, how do you not undervalue the Bible, and how do you not um, miss the fact that it is God's Word that changes people? Yeah. Oh, it is God's Word that changes people. I want people to, I want people to know the truth of the Bible. What I'm saying is it, it's not an effective way of reasoning with someone to say, you've got to believe this because the Bible says it. I want to commend to people the truth of the Bible, but I want to commend it in a way that actually resonates with some of the ways people are thinking. And so when someone plays the harm card and says, well, actually, you know, these sexual ethics today, they, they don't harm anyone, so how can it be wrong? I want to say, well, let's, let's talk about the impact of no-fault divorce on children. How do we know what harm is? How do we measure harm? Are we taking account of not just harm to each other that is tangible and immediate, but are we taking account of, of indirect harm that might come over you know, a longer period of time on a whole group of other people? There's, there's ways of, of commending the truth of the Bible in ways that actually appeal to things that matter to our secular friends. So I, I want the message of, I want the truth out, but I, I kind of want, I don't just want to announce, hey, you've, you've got to believe what the Bible says. I want to show people why what the Bible says is so believable. Questions are coming in thick and fast, so we'll have to be selective. Mm. Um, here's a general question, and I guess in some ways you've spoken to this, but how do we react or support people in our lives, especially young Christians who are part of the LGBTQ community? So what was the first part of that? How do we uh, react or support people, react to or support people in our lives who are part of the LGBTQ community? Yeah, and, and sorry to sound like a, a crack record, but uh, you know, every person we meet is going to be different. They're going to have a different experience, a different story. So we do need to, again, listen really well to people. Uh, there'll be some people who are LGBTQI who's, who've, who've had a journey of extraordinary pain. Uh, maybe they've been betrayed or bullied or demeaned by people, and that's been part of their journey. We need, to, if that's the case, that that should shape how we respond. Um, so again, we want to be we want to be to others what Jesus has been to us. Jesus was was the friend of sinners. Uh, that means Jesus could could draw near to someone without joining in with their sin. He could differ with someone without rejecting them. And he could love someone without affirming them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here as Christians. And so we want to show people that is, that is the way we should be because we're wanting to express the heart of Jesus to the people around us. And that the moral grammar, that the relational grammar of our, of our culture right now is if you don't affirm me, you're not my friend and you don't love me. We just need to show that that's not the case. That may take time. But I think that is one of the ways we can respond to friends of ours who, who identify as gay, who identify as any of those different ways of identifying is, to, is just to be there for the long haul and to make the fact that we are for people We've got to keep proving that by our actions. Somebody wants to know, what was the end to the protesters' story? Did some of them change their opinions after their interaction with you? Um, I don't think so, but we had a nice conversation, and I, I invited them to come into the event. I said, if you want to come in and listen, um, I will I'll be happy to meet with you afterwards, and you can tell me afterwards how you felt it went and whether you thought it was harmful. Um, I knew that the event would have a QA, and a and I said, if you, if you, again, if you want to come, I'll make sure you are the first at the microphone to ask a question. Um, as it happened, they had another event to go to. So um, <laughs> genuinely, had, they had something else to go So they were there to protest this event, and then they had something else that they needed to be at. So none of them actually did stick around, but um, I would have loved to have continued those conversations. I, I have a soft spot for protest. I used to do some protesting when I was, when I was a teenager, so I, I've always got a soft spot for, for protesters. I, you know... Um, as a friend of mine once said, how can we live in a world like this and not protest something? Um, so I, yeah, even if they think I'm the embodiment of evil, I, I still want to have a conversation. We, this, this almost never happens, but there was one Sunday where 
my church in Nashville, we had some people protesting because there was something we were going to be, someone was going to be speaking on and all that kind of thing. And we, we, some, we got a tip off um, that this was going to be happening. We found out the day before some people were planning to protest. So we thought, well, let's be ready for them. Which means let's have tables of coffee and donuts out because if they're going to protest our church, we want that to be the most pleasant experience <laughs> of protesting they've ever had. And make sure some of us are free to chat with any of them who want to chat. And if they want to come in and, and sit in the service, they're very welcome to them. We'll talk to them afterwards. It's great to do that. One last question. And you're going to be around for a few minutes afterwards, are you? <laughs> and I'm sure Sam's books will answer many of the questions we didn't get to this evening. Thanks for everyone who has sent in questions. So here's a difficult one, very specific one to end with. And you can then throw your answer out there and run if you want to. But... Um, <laughs> A very, I guess, um, a question that's becoming more of an issue or a relevant issue is how do we respond when, as Christians, when somebody perhaps invites them to their same-sex wedding? Um, recently in the press there's been some controversy around this question yeah. um, in the Christian world, and obviously it's a tough question to answer. How would you go about even thinking through that question? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a key question, and it's, it's one I, I hear more often than, than most other questions. Christians are often coming to me and saying, hey, my, my really good friend is, is getting married. It's going to be a same-sex partnership. Do I go? And my response is always, thank you for being the kind of Christian your gay friend wants at their wedding. Way to go. And for those of us who, who never receive such an invite, it's worth asking the question, are we being the kind of presence among our friends that Jesus would want us to be. Now, that doesn't answer the question, but it affirms the person who's, who's asking it. Um, and you will realize that you know, different Christians land in, in different places on this, and I, I've got some, some dear Christian friends who land in a slightly different place to me on this, and I respect them. They're, they're doing that with a good Christian conscience. But I, I, I think this is a wisdom issue. And so I don't think there's one answer that fits every scenario. Um, I think there can be, my answer is I think there can be some very good reasons for not going, some good, potentially good reasons to go, some bad reasons for not going, and some bad reasons to go. Good reasons to not go would be, firstly, if, you're, if in your conscience you think you shouldn't, the Bible says we're to obey our consciences. Or if you think attending is, is going to miscommunicate approval and affirmation, that would be a good reason not to go. Um, there may be some potential good reason. I don't, I don't want to say it would never be right for someone to go. I've, I know of Christians who have gone, and I think have gone for, 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 good, for good reasons. One said, well, they know exactly what I think, but this is an opportunity to perhaps be the only Christian in a, in a room of a hundred or so people for a few hours. Or there may be other factors that just make you think, I think I need to physically be in the room. A bad reason for not going is because you think these people are beneath you. That's a lousy reason for not going, because they're not. If they're beneath you, then you haven't quite understood the gospel yet. Um, and a bad reason to go would be because you don't ever want there to be causing any conflict. You don't ever want to, you know, raise a matter that might be difficult or disagree. That, that's a poor reason to go. Uh, what we want is, is for people to know how much they mean to us. And we want people to know how much Jesus means to us. And if we can convey both of those things, whether through our attending or non-attending, I think we're doing the right thing. really appreciate your wisdom uh, in the way you've answered that. And I think what it does say as well is we need to be very careful about not being gracious towards others who perhaps land in slightly different places, having reasoned it out slightly differently, but who hold to those convictions that you've yeah. just articulated. Yeah. So thank you. Sam, it's been great to have you with us. We really appreciate My the pleasure. time. Can we give Sam a round of applause for being with us this evening? And um, let me just say in closing, there is a book table, and uh, please go and have a look at that. And while I've got the microphone, if you're not part of a church and you'd like to come and join us on Sunday, we would love to have you. We meet here at 8.15 and 10. Do come and join us if you'd like to do that. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that directs all of life, that um, 
is good for us and that shows us the way to live uh, to, in order to experience the kind of flourishing and joy that you want for us. Help us, Lord, to align our lives uh, around your word and in submission to your word. And then give us great wisdom as we try and work out what that means in some of the complexities of this world. So won't you go with us now and pass us with your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.